Hi, I'm Amar Patel, an engineer on the Direct3D team, here to talk to you about the resource bind model in DX12. It's quite a flexible system that gives you as a programmer quite a lot of low-level control over hardware. This slide deck is long, and some of the slides are densely packed. The text mostly speaks for itself. Listening to my narration and the accompanying occasional finger doodles is entirely optional. It's assumed that you have a working knowledge of GPU programming. In particular, you have an awareness of the way the DirectX APIs have exposed graphics hardware through concepts like memory views, like render target views or shader resource views, to expose data and memory, and the way the high-level shading language is the way to write programs that run on the GPU. Some knowledge of DX12 concepts is also assumed, like pipeline state objects, command lists, and so on. If you find that you would like to know more about any of these concepts, of course you can stop this slide deck and fill in some blanks elsewhere on the internet or wherever and come back. This is about connecting data to the shaders that you have running on the GPU. In a few places, you'll see some of the different ways different hardware could implement the same API, DX12 but this is not about calling out specific details of individual graphics vendors and by name. Uh, for that, you can look at vendor-specific documentation or forums. The resource spine model in DX12 is designed to incur very low system overhead. In particular, the most high-frequency APIs are extremely thin. The design also scales across low-end to high-end hardware, as well as very old to very new hardware. An additional goal was to enable applications that are used to binding resources in a particular order or fashion, such as the way they might have bound resources on the DX11 API, to migrate over to DX12 without having to be forced to reshuffle things while still achieving reasonably good API performance in DX12. And at the same time, with the same programming paradigm, applications can evolve into more modern ways of exploiting hardware with the extra flexi flexibility that DX12 exposes. This is a summary of the various resource types that can be created in the DX12 API. Texture 1D, 2D, 3D, various forms of buffer, and there's also arrays, and the MS stands for uh, multi-sample buffers. There's nothing different here from DX11. There is a lot of new flexibility in the way the underlying memory for these resources can be allocated in the DX12 API, with concepts like heaps, reserve resources, placed resources, committed resources. Those topics are out of scope here. Here's a summary of the various view types that can be created in DX12, mostly similar to DX11 with the addition of index buffer and vertex buffer views. These weren't views in DX11. Now, while views point to some other memory in a resource, samplers are self-contained objects. The reason they're in the same list as views here is that in the DX12 API, they're managed in a similar way to some of the other views, and that'll become clear later. A descriptor is the atomic unit of binding in the DX12 API. It's just a chunk of data in a hardware-specific format somewhere in memory. As an application, you can ask hardware to create a descriptor with various parameters. Like if you're making a shader resource view, you would specify what resource you're making the view on and what, what which MIP maps, for example, in the resource you want the view to contain. That information is encoded by the hardware into a descriptor. Now, as an application, when you use a descriptor, when you ask the, a shader, for example, to reference a given descriptor to look at a texture, for example, it's your burden as an application to make sure that the descriptor is valid at the moment the shader on the a shader on the GPU is executing and references the descriptor. Like the memory it's pointing to has to still be present and you know, not freed or not made non-resident. There's no OS tracking of what's in a descriptor or even the existence of a descriptor.
There's one ex small exception, and that's render target bindings, where the runtime does have to track and inspect render target descriptors in order for it to make swap chains work. That's a that's considered to be a small overhead because the frequency of render target changes is extremely low compared to the amount of switching of other types of bindings like textures or constants. A descriptor heap is a storage for descriptors. It's basically just an array of descriptors in memory. Descriptor heaps are broadly categorized in two classes, shader visible and non-shader visible. The shader visible descriptor heaps function to hold descriptors that the GPU and shaders are referencing during execution, whereas non-shader visible descriptor heaps largely function as a way for applications to stage descriptors on the CPU, perhaps before they want to upload them to a shader visible descriptor heap. It's not actually a requirement to do that, though. It's perfectly fine for an application to write a or generate a descriptor directly into a shader visible descriptor heap. Another use for non shader visible descriptor heaps is that certain descriptor types only need to live in non shader visible heaps. They don't actually need to live in shader visible ones, so that distinction is clarified a little more later. Why can't descriptors live arbitrarily anywhere in memory? Well, it turns out that a lot of hardware is basically hardwired to fetch descriptors from basically descriptor heap style layout because it requires fewer addressing bits. Now, there is some hardware that can actually support having descriptors live anywhere in memory, but even on that hardware, having them organized in heap layout does provide a small addressing savings as well. So DirectX just chooses to expose descriptors in descriptor heaps for all hardware. Descriptor heaps can be created in various types, where each descriptor heap type only stores descriptors of that type. There's one exception, and, that, and that's a descriptor heap type that can store any arbitrary mix of constant buffer views, shader resource views, and unordered access views in one allocation in memory. The reason that works is that the sizes of these types of descriptors is relatively close to each other, and it works for hardware to represent the storage for these descriptors in a descriptor heap whose slot size is the union of the sizes of these three types of descriptors. This is convenient because it allows an application to store these types of descriptors organized by material ID or object ID contiguously in memory. The other descriptor types require their own dedicated heaps simply because the individual descriptor sizes varies very wildly. Uh, and in one case, samplers, it turns out that those descriptors just need to be in their own memory just due to hardware constraint. This is a listing of the various descriptor heap types that can be created. You'll note that only a couple of the descriptor heap types can be created in shader visible memory, and that's because these are the descriptors that shaders during execution on the GPU can reference directly. Now these descriptors can also be placed in uh, non-shader visible or CPU memory simply as a convenience just uh, if you if as an application you want to stage them in CPU memory before writing them uh, placing them in, in uh, shader visible descriptor heap and again that's just an optional uh, thing. The other descriptor heap types are uh, as you can see only allowed to be in non-shader visible or CPU descriptor heaps, and the the way these descriptors are used is covered uh, a little bit later. A descriptor handle at the API identifies a location in a descriptor heap. It's a device unique address in the sense that the descriptor handle doesn't distinguish which descriptor heap the descriptor happens to live in. What this allows for, for example, is a descriptor copy method could take in an array of descriptor handles and perform a gather operation on a set of descriptors that happen to come from 
any number of source descriptor heaps or or potentially all from the same source descriptor heap and copy to some destination so the api doesn't have to take in a collection of heap location and offsets instead it can just take an array of handles so basically the handle it sort of functions like a pointer but it's opaque in the sense that it hides the hardware specific implementation so the way to get a handle to a descriptor heap is to call one of these two methods it basically gives the handle to the start uh, now there's two types of descriptor handles CPU descriptor handles and GPU descriptor handles CPU descriptor handles are used for methods on the device interface that operate immediately so for example if you issue a, a descriptor copy command on the device you pass in descriptor CPU descriptor handles to identify the source and dest locations and the operation happens immediately whereas the GPU descriptor handle is used to identify on a command list uh, a location in a descriptor heap that the GPU can reference um, at execution time let's look at some things we can do with descriptor handles from the previous slide we saw we could retrieve the handle to the start of a descriptor heap with this method we can retrieve a descriptor increment size which is a hardware specific value that identifies for a given descriptor heap type how to increment a handle to be able to identify any location within a descriptor heap so the safe things that can be done with descriptor handles are this offsetting of the handle copying the handle value around perhaps in your data structures and finally the most useful thing which is passing the handle right into the d3d 12 apis for things like creating descriptors at some location in a heap or copying descriptors around what you must not do with descriptor handles is try to actually analyze the ptr member for things like trying to understand what the bit layout might be uh, because it's just a hardware specific thing and it's so in, in that sense the the handle is meant to be created as an opaque value if you want to shield your app from directly manipulating the PTR member to offset handles the d3dx 12 header has a wrapper class for descriptor handles that can make your code look a little bit cleaner it's not a requirement to use it though so what's going on with these descriptor types index buffer views vertex buffer views and so on that we previously mentioned can only be placed in non shader visible descriptor heaps their only purpose is to be a translation of API view for parameters as opposed to these other descriptor types that are actually referenced by the GPU while shaders are executing so these types of descriptors here only serve to identify while a command list is being recorded what bindings are uh, you're trying to do so for example if you're call if you call set render targets while recording a command list and pass in to the call a set of descriptor handles to the render targets that you want to bind uh, and maybe a depth sensor view the driver immediately copies the descriptors that you pass in into its own command list memory so basically immediately upon returning from the api call the descriptor memory that you passed in is free to be changed right away for the next call if you want because the driver doesn't hold any ha any reference to the these descriptors that you pass into the api The set render targets API is one resource binding method that's worth calling out in a little bit of detail just because the parameters have a little bit of a quirk about them that is meant to be a little convenience but without some explanation can be confusing so what's going on is we're binding some number of render targets and here's the descriptors for them and uh, potentially also a depth stencil uh, buffer as well but what's interesting is 
this parameter here and it's basically a flag indicating how this pointer to the descriptors to the render targets to, to bind works. So basically if this parameter RT's single handle to descriptor range is true, it means that this pointer is basically pointing to a range, a contiguous range of descriptors in a descriptor heap uh, containing the render targets uh, view, render target views that you want to bind. On the other hand, if this parameter is false, what this p render target descriptors parameter refers to is a array of descriptor handles. So the it's in memory it's a contiguous set of descriptor handles of this many descriptor handles that uh, represent the render target views that you want to bind. So in this mode, you are able to do a gather of a set of disjoint descriptors, whereas in this other mode, you are basically identifying a range of descriptors that you've staged somewhere in a CPU visible descriptor heap.